Din's Legacy is the lazy RPG from developer Soldak Entertainment, whose MO includes making some of the most complicated and intricate ARPGs on the market, but they tend to suffer when it comes to quality of life and accessibility issues. And sadly, Din's Legacy is yet another example of it. But its unique touches on the RPG formula may be enough to win over new and old fans. So, the basic story is essentially a carryover from his previous game, Zombicide. But there really is no story needed to... You don't really need to follow the story, I should say. But you're in a fantasy world that has been ravaged by a zombie plague. And in the midst or the process of doing that, we now have mutants living in this world. And just like I guess all over, there is racism between elves and orcs and zombies and even mutants. Everybody just hates each other. And it's up to you to spread the word that mutants are actually a force for good by saving the land one step at a time. As with all of his previous games, you start with picking your profession or class. Now in previous titles, you were able to select from a character with three unique skill trees, or two if you decide to dual class. This time, you can only choose from one skill tree or one group of abilities, as well as the basics or passives that dictate armor requirements, weapons you can use, so on and so forth. Now if you look at all those classes on the left hand side of the screen, more become unlocked as you play and that becomes a major factor with Din's Legacy's unique ability when it comes to growing your character out as the game goes on. But as with his previous titles, you'll choose from a wide selection of warriors, wizards, thieves, different kinds of mages and all that other great stuff. And if you see at the bottom, you can also choose from a hardcore or semi-hardcore experience. I would actually recommend if you're looking for a challenge, go for semi-hardcore instead of hardcore. And we'll talk about why that is later on in this video. But once you have picked your character, you the game will allow you to procedurally generate the world that you're going to play in. Determining what the starting levels of the enemies will be, how many quests show up, the overall difficulty, and other factors that you can see. And this has always been a major part of Soldak Entertainment's titles. That the world itself is not only procedurally built, but it features emergent gameplay, or essentially an emergent development in terms of how things work. If you've played any other ARPG, then you know, or even just an RPG, that quests and events are usually preset. The very famous, you know, JRPG, the world's gonna come to an end, but you can still spend 15 hours doing side quests. In the Soldat games, however, that is not the case. Everything is dynamic, and quests can change the scope of the world or make things easier or harder if you choose to ignore or engage them. When the game says that somebody's about to do something bad, they are literally about to do something bad, and if you don't stop it, you are in deep trouble. And this can lead to difficulties or different worlds spiraling out of control if too many bad events happen and you're not able to recoup it. Just as your character is dynamically built or procedurally built based on what skills you choose, the game goes for a very engagement or emergent enemy design as well. Enemies of course belong to various classes and species, but they'll have all matter of passive modifiers and elite and epic and all those other great status or should I say nightmare statuses that can come back to hurt you. And things can get crazy in any one of Soldak's games. Because everything is completely and 100% procedurally generated, you never know what is going to happen. You could start a game and literally find the main event that you need to beat the world within a second of walking outside. Or things can go horribly, horribly wrong and something like this can happen inside your starting base. Now, in previous titles, you had multiple objectives you could go after to quote-unquote beat the world. 
in this one, or in Din's Legacy, each world has one mega event, and that's that purple icon you see in the upper left hand corner of the screen. If you can beat that event, the world is cleared, you go back to the world generation screen, and you will build another world. And you'll keep going. As you go up in level, or in character level, you'll eventually unlock the harder mob fires, which of course make enemies more challenging, but raises the quality of the loot as well. Now, right there you'll see the relationship screen as you're able to interact with the various clans as you meet them. Now, one thing to keep in mind about Din's Legacy that I want to bring up here, that the game alludes to clan management, such as having people who can join you, dealing with food or hunting and stuff like that, and as of the time of this recording, I don't know if those elements are previously held over from Zombicite, or if they will be featured in this one. Right now, Din's Legacy is in early access, and what you see may not represent the current version of the game. But, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more changes, especially in terms of balance, as the game continues its early access. Now, with all that said, let's get to the big element, but what makes this game so different? You can just see it pop up there. In previous, or in any other ARPG, Characters are hardcore in terms of their skills and their progressions. You kill enemies, you gain a new skill, and everybody who's that same class gets it. But with Din's Legacy, the big feature of this game is a mutation element. You not only have an experience bar, but you have a mutation bar as well. And as you fight and gain experience, your character will mutate. And what mutating does is provide a procedural progression curve to your character as you play. What happens is that every time you mutate, you get something new. You could get another class's passive or active skill. You could get maybe a special ability. Or you can even get unique modifiers that can become attached to one of your skills. So you could have like your starter skill maybe gain the ability to start volcanoes every time you kill an enemy. Maybe another skill will gain an increased chance of accuracy. And these modifiers or abilities are completely procedural. You never know what you're going to get. You can also get negative mutations such as becoming afraid of orcs or doing less damage with a certain weapon type and stuff like that. And it's a very clever way of changing things on a procedural level, but you can go further than that, as you can see right here, with the mutation ability. Every time you level up, you gain one mutation point. That what this does, it allows you a bit more control over your character. By mutating, you can basically choose another specialty. And what this means is that your character will essentially combine your skill trees with another specialty. Now to make things balance or be completely unruly, any skills that you already have a point in or you are part of your gear requirements as in let's say the axe perk or a mail armor perk, those will not change. But everything else has a chance of becoming randomly swapped with the specialty that you've chosen. And this is where Din's Legacy begins to get just really crazy in terms of the potential abilities of your character. If you want to be a warrior who rushes into battle, uses a magician's blinding flash to stun enemies, then can cut enemies down, causes their corpses to explode like a necromancer, and then shoot and and then lay down an explosive trap by a hunter, you can do all that. It is entirely up to you in terms of how your character grows. Now, the mutation ability is random, which means that you can't exactly be 100% accurate, but this creates a lot of emergent gameplay in terms of potential applications of your characters. And I can see people who really want to dig into Din's Legacy creating some massively overpowered people. But while all this sounds potentially amazing, 
Unfortunately, Din's Legacy suffers from quite the same bit of issues as Soldax's previous games, mainly in the quality of life and accessibility parts. The big point about Din's Legacy is that, quite frankly, it doesn't have a very good first impression. As you've probably seen from watching this video, the graphics or even just the aesthetics don't even come close to other ARPGs on the market like Diablo, Path of Exile, and something like Grim Dawn. And Soul Deck has made or reused a lot of its same art and music assets for all of its titles, and it's beginning to show. The UI is serviceable, it's definitely a little bit better than it was in Zombicite, but it can still be a bit unruly, such as trying to get icons to appear, or get them onto your UI, and even just finding the information that you need. But the real area where it hurts is with the world generation. Unfortunately, Din's Legacy, as with Zombicite, is a bad example of procedurally generated levels or environmental design. Every area has this kind of throw everything together look to it without much sense of consistency or order. It's a far cry from a game like Spelunky, or even something like Diablo 3 in terms of generating a procedurally generated level that, while it may be original, still has some sense of flow to it. Many times with the world generation, I will end up in places that there's like no easy exits at the start. One time I took a shortcut that literally put me into a wall and I couldn't get out of it without having to use that shortcut again. And when you combine that with the enemies and just the overall chaotic nature of the game, it can become very frustrating to play. This is a title where you can have the game literally spawn ambush events right into your starting base or right out front of enemies two to three levels above you and have them just decimate you. And you're going to find that most of your deaths in Din's Legacy will either come from one unassuming enemy that just waylays you with a few hits or massive amounts of enemies all surrounding you, effects going off, explosions and magic and ice and all that and you're just going to get overwhelmed like that. And that's why I would suggest not to play this on pure hardcore difficulty. You just, it's just so easy to lose control due to the chaotic nature that it can make it a little bit more frustrating, especially when you're trying to see more of the character customization. Now, they have used this procedural system for all of Soldax's previous games. The only one where I felt it wasn't that big of a deal was Drox Operative. And that was because that game took place in outer space, so you don't really have to worry about a quote-unquote environment on that front. But, with that said, let's begin to wrap things up here. Din's Legacy's biggest point has to be the procedurally generated character progression. And I want to see that be developed further, along with more quality of life improvements. Now, like I said earlier, the game is still in early access, so there may be a chance things will improve, but I don't think we're going to be seeing a massive change in terms of presentation from now to when the game is done its early access period. As with all of Soldax games, they occupy a very specific niche of ARPG design. If you fall into that niche, these games are probably deeper and more customizable than just about any other ARPG on the market. But if you can't get past the quality of life issues and just the low presentation, you're just not going to find that much here. And I'm still hoping that one day, Soldac will have that breakout game to the mainstream. But I think that's going to take not just the complexity and depth of its game design, but an improvement in aesthetics and presentation as well. For fans of Soldax's previous works, I'm curious what you think about Din's legacy so far, and for those of you who are new, what do you think about an ARPG of this style? Let me know in the comments below, but that is going to do it for this first look, and as things develop, we may come back to it on the stream or with videos in the future. But I would like to thank Soldak for giving me a press key to check this one out. And you can currently find this again on Steam with early access. And I think you may be able to buy it from his site as well. 
But with that said, if you're working on your own game that you let me to take a look at in the future, please don't hesitate to get in touch and check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we resemble the art and science of games. Until next time, this has been Din's Legacy, and have a good night. Before we get to the credits, just a quick shout out to the supporters over on patreon.com slash gwbicer. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check back for our regular streaming most nights at 9.30, 10 EST, and you'll find a schedule link down below. For a collection of my writings as well as audio casts on design, you'll find that at game-wisdom.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at gwbicer. If you're interested in hanging out and talking about game design topics, we have a Discord channel with the basic tier open to everybody, and that is linked down below as well. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, it is at patreon.com slash gwbicer. Your support can help to keep things going and growing, and you can earn rewards such as ad-free versions of our talks, votings for our specific Let's Plays and grab bag streams, and more. But that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. I hope you come back for more great discussions on design here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games.